Okay, tonight we're going to be doing Galatians 4, 17 through 20. The, this is going to take just a little bit of time to get us back up to speed, because verse 17 uh, doesn't really make a lot of sense if um, we just start right at verse 17. So we'll go back up to uh, a couple of verses earlier here, or at least starts a sentence. Where then is it that that sense of blessing you had? And remember, this is Paul talking to the people of Galatia, uh, the church of Galatia. For I bear you witness that if possible you would have plucked your, out your eyes and given them to me. We talked about this last week, about this real strong connection that Paul had with the Galatian people when he visited. However, he's asking, where is that sense of blessing that you had? In other words, where did your happiness go would be another way of saying this. Um, and he's, of course, referring to the Judaizers who have come in and attempted to get the Galatian church to buy into their legalistic uh, principles, for instance, trying to get them to the, uh, the Gentiles to become circumcised, to eat the right foods, to celebrate the correct festivals and feasts, etc. Verse 16, so I have become your enemy by telling you the truth. Here, Paul, again, we talked about this last week. Here, Paul is just referring to the fact that, um, you know, he, he's communicated the gospel message to him. The Judaizers have come in. And now it feels like to Paul that he has become this enemy of theirs as they have moved away from the grace message and in back into this legalistic law-based uh, message of the Judaizers. Okay, so that's a little bit of the background. But tonight we're going to be talking about verses 17 through 20. And there's some really very uh, powerful principles in these verses. I'm going to read all four of them to begin with. And I'm going to point out a few things, and then we're going to dig deep into them. So verse 17 says, They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out, so that you will seek them. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner, and not only when I am present with you. My children, with who I am, who I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you, but I could wish to present with you now, and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Well, again, these four verses, when just taken with no explanation, appear to be a little bit all over the map. But I think as we unpack these tonight, we're going to see that this makes a lot of sense in the context of what was really going on between uh, the Galatian church and basically this kind of, and we'll go through this even further here, but Paul had a message to the Gal people of Galatia. And of course, Paul's passion was towards the Gentiles and Judaizers, came in and started talking to the church of Galatia, saying, wait a second, this whole grace thing is, well, it's okay and all, but you can't forget the fact that there's this law part of the deal. And Paul is explaining something here in verse 17. They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. There's a whole lot going on here that's pretty strong. They eagerly seek you. Now, what's happening is, as you can see, is he's talking here about the Judaizers eagerly seeking the people of the Galatian church, eagerly trying to influence them. So what we're going to do now, as we do always, is we're going to start looking at different perspectives of this verse from different theological viewpoints. First of all, um, and we're going to do it in, from three different perspectives. One, the Dallas Theological Seminary. And then two is we're going to see what Calvin, uh, John Calvin, uh, had to say about this. And then three, we're going to see how Luther, Martin Luther, looked at this. Um, all evangelical, but at times very different perspectives on these verses in Galatians that I find to be fascinating. Uh, first of all, from Dallas, 
uh, they mention that in verse 17 and 18, the legalists had improper motives, Judaizers used flattery and wanted to alienate the Galatians from Paul. And so in a very, from a very simple perspective, this is really what Paul is talking about here in verse 17, is that this they eagerly seek you was the concept of these Judaizers attempting to flatter the people of Galatia into buying into their theology. Yeah, when I read that, I thought they're trying to manipulate them. Exactly. That's exactly what was happening. The Judaizers were zealous to win over the Galatians so that the Galatians would be zealous for the Judaizers. So they eagerly seek you, not commendably, uh, but interesting here, they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. So if we start getting a feel for what's going on here is they're using flattery and they're saying these things to you in order that they can get something out of you. And that's what he means by the wrong motivations. And so from the perspective of, and we'll start applying this here shortly, but from the perspective of Dallas, basically in a very simple way, the Judaizers are using flattery to manipulate them, to manipulate the people of Galatia. Now, Calvin makes some very uh, interesting points. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to talk about, um, actually, I'm going to pull up a new screen because I want you to kind of visually see what this really looks like. And so you have the Judaizers here, and then we're going to come back to the different viewpoints of Calvin and Luther back to the previous screen in just a second. In fact, I'll pull myself over because we're not going to need me in this section. Okay, so you've got the Judaizers. Put a circle. Oh, that's real nice. <laughs> exactly what I didn't want to do. Okay. They were standing on a hill. Yeah, so you have the Judaizers. I don't even know if you know how to spell it. That's how you spell it. All right, and Judaizer. they're trying to influence the Galatians. And then you have Paul here that has already <laughs> nice. Okay, then you have Paul over here who has influenced the people of Galatia with his message of grace. Then you have the Judaizers here trying to infuse legalism into the church. Okay, so this is how it's set up. But what's, I, I believe, crucial here is that there's a couple different ways to, um, there's a couple different ways, there's two types of manipulation is what I'm trying to say. And it's all manipulation for sure, but the one type of manipulation is shame, and another type of manipulation is flattery. And so what Paul's talking about going on here is that Judaizers are using the, uh, the manipulative uh, tendency of flattery in order to get the Galatians to see things their way and to do what they basically do what the, Jude what the Jews do and do things their way. Now, over here in verse 17, it says, They eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. So what's happening now is he's saying they're going further than just coming up with concepts of communicating to the Galatians. What they really want to do is cut off. Now this shut out is a word that we've used in the past number of verses in chapters 3 and 4, which means like an imprisonment, if you remember yeah. what we were talking about before. Go ahead, Lisa. To bind you up. Yeah. And he's using that same language here. They, they, they want to shut out 
to bind you up, to put you in prison. To make now, you constipated. Kind of like that. Yeah. Now, one of the things that, uh, you know, one of the things that's happening here that Calvin brings out very clearly is this is a very common occurrence within church work. <laughs> okay? Because what happens is, is that people come in and they try to get other people to do things their way. And to do that, their goal, this is psychologically, you would call this splitting. And so what was happening here is the Judaizers want to split off the relationship Paul has with the Galatians and then use flattery to get the Galatians to do what the Judaizers want them to do. And so... Well, it's what kids, it's what kids try to do when they're playing their parents against each other. Exactly. It's the same kind of thing. Now, so let's go back here for a second and we'll be able to see some of the con see some of the things that uh, Calvin says he says they are jealous means that the Judaizers were jealous from an improper desire of obtaining a reputation and a following from the Galatians and so one of the things that he mentioned here is a very astute observation that what's really happening here is the Judaizers want to be the popular kids on the block and so mm -hmm. They weren't uh, eagerly seeking the people of Galatia out for motives that were good. In fact, they wanted to uh, get something out of them. They wanted to get a good reputation. They wanted to become popular. They needed to feel influential. They needed to feel like they were somebody. Well, of course, without getting in too deep into this, we all understand that anybody that's living inside a legalistic approach to life is constantly battling, trying to find their value and worth from something outside themselves. And so this would be a natural tendency is for legal people that are trying to find their value from something outside themselves, that's legalism. Something that they do people for people to like them, for how well they perform, that is legalism, and they're trying to find their value from that. And so this is a typical response. The Judaizers are trying to seek out the Galatians. They have to. Why? Because their whole perspective is that if they can get the Galatians to like them more, then they're better people. If they can get the Galat if they can perform better than their better people. And so the whole mindset of the Judaizers live in this kind of legalistic, bound up thought process that we all fight. Calvin goes on to say, go ahead, Lisa. That's just a really good illustration. I'm looking at your, the formula. The, yeah. Um, that's a really helpful way in seeing that they're both going towards the Galatians and what's happening with grace and what's happening with legalism. It's a good illustration. Yeah. Now, Calvin further says, they seek to exclude means the Judaizers are determined to kindle strife between Paul and the Galatians. Well, this language shut you out right here. Calvin is actually using his own version of a translation from the Latin. And his version that he's using in his commentary uses language that says they seek to exclude. And so he's what he's saying is uh, that's his version. And then, of course, New American Standard says shut you out. He's making it very clear that the Judaizers are determined to kindle strife between Paul and the Galatians. And that's where I came up with this right here this splitting that's going on. Right. Now, here's an interesting comment that Calvin makes, again, very astutely. He says, this strategy is frequently resorted to 
by all the ministers of Satan, by producing in the people a dislike of their pastor. They hope afterwards to draw them, other people in their congregation, for instance, to themselves, so they can be the popular kids on the block. Now, I added so they wow. can be the popular kids on the block, of course, but Calvin is suggesting that this kind of thing is very common because he applies it directly to the church, and this, this would have been the 16th century church. However, I don't think much has changed in the last <laughs> 500 years. Holy cow. But Calvin yeah. recognizes... I mean, we, go ahead. We just so easily get drawn into that. We don't realize that us complaining or carrying on about what we don't like within a, any denomination you know, there's a fine line between a healthy assessment and wanting us ourselves to feel popular. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. And again, uh, I don't want to take a lot of time on this because this is the kind of thing we talk about in the Lives Transforming webinar and not the Bible study. But, of course, if you're coming at life from a perspective of legalism, not a perspective of grace, that means grace says you're already good enough. Grace says you're already complete. Grace says the righteousness of Christ is in you. Legalism says you have to do something to be good enough. And so the natural tendency of anybody living a paradigm of legalism is going to be, I need to be uh, the popular kid on the block. And so the strategy is to produce people to dislike someone else so they will like you. Yeah. This is exactly what the Judaizers are doing. This is exactly what legalism would do. However, again, just as a quick sidebar, if we really understood grace, this wouldn't even make any sense to do this. Because having someone like us more wouldn't add to our value, wouldn't make us feel more worthy wouldn't give us a feeling that we were somehow better than. And in light of that, there would be no reason to split. There would, splitting wouldn't occur. Uh, there would be no reason to try to get someone to dislike someone else so that they'll like you. None of that makes any sense in a paradigm of grace, as we've talked about before. I just heard a, a quote today. It said, um, this is somewhat related, gossip is hearing something you like about someone you don't like. So when you think about that splitting and trying to divide, yep. he hearing something we like about someone we don't like. Yeah. And this splitting is something that is very common in, in churches when different leaders, elders, deacons, pastors are trying to get more power to make themselves feel better about themselves. This is a very common occurrence. This is exactly what was going on in uh, the Church of Galatia. <clears throat> and uh, Paul is referencing it. And it's going to come, again, from a legalistic perspective. It's very normal for that to happen. A person that's got a legalistic perspective is going to naturally work towards splitting. Okay. And a legalistic perspective is basically judging. And well, let me... we're judging... We're not liking ourselves. Well, let me make we're it more clear. Realizing we're complete. Yeah, a legalistic perspective says, my worth comes from what I do. My worth right. comes from what I do. My worth comes from what other people think. My worth comes by my influence. In other words, my worth comes from something external. Anytime we try to get our worth from something external, it's legalism. Because grace is about getting our worth from what's internal. God in us already makes us good enough, which gives us the power to never even think about splitting, never even think about going along trying to get someone to dislike someone else so they'll like you more. It doesn't even make any sense in a paradigm of grace because Grace says you're already completed. You don't need someone else to like you more to feel better about yourself. Okay. Right. All right. Now, verse 18, just very quickly. Calvin, I'll read it here. 
Calvin suggests, well, first I'll read it, but it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner, and not only when I am present with you. So what Paul is doing is he's saying, look, it, it, it's the problem really, he's, not want, he's like, I don't want to get people weird about this. I'm not trying to suggest that people seeking you out is a bad thing, but he's trying to say there's a big difference between creating an environment where people are seeking you out because you're serving them and creating an environment where you're seeking where people are seeking you out because you're trying to manipulate them and so he's pointing out that the motive matters here in one sense people could be seeking us out because we're serving in another sense people could be seeking us out because we're trying to manipulate them to seek us out and again yeah. If we pull this back over to here, this paradigm is going to be one of serving, and this paradigm is going to be one of manipulation. Yep. Okay. And Calvin says, there can be jealousy in a good sense, and that is zealous devotion to imitate the good qualities of another person. For instance, this concept of zealous or jealous, it, it can be uh, good, and the example I give here, um, for those of us that know Cheryl, she's not on the call tonight, but she's got an incredible gift of encouragement. And my comment simply was, Cheryl's encouragement gift spurs me on. In other words, makes me zealous to do likewise. It, yeah. it motivates me to, to encourage other people when, in fact, it's not exactly my greatest uh, spiritual gift, that's for sure. <laughs> no, no. Derek, one of them. Go ahead. One of, one of the things in here I was reading about, the source of the zeal uh, from these guys might have been coming from a desire to avoid persecution. As you know, it's one thing to, to be zealous, you know, to be encouraging, and the other side of this was they were being zealous possibly to avoid persecution from the, the Jewish nationals. Yeah. yeah so I don't know. I mean, I was just, I was reading about that, and, and it could be the opposite side. They were just trying to get out of being persecuted. Right. Yeah, I mean, they could have been, well, and clearly they are going to be persecuted because if the Jews find out that the, the Gentiles are not interested at all in circumcision, uh, that's right. going to be offensive to Jews. It's going to threaten them big time. Yeah, absolutely. It even goes back to one of the earlier chapters we were talking about where Paul says, I just wish they would cut themselves off. Yeah. Remember when he says that? Right, exactly. Ouch. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's John look at it. Let's look at just for a few minutes, let's look at what's going on here with Luther as he looks at these verses. Luther suggests uh, that Paul criticizes the flattery of the Judaizers and suggests that the Galatians should not be uh, seduced in by the zeal. In other words, something that is... As you can see, Calvin makes some very good points about the risk of us, you and I, becoming a Judaizer, someone that feels like they need uh, to try to manipulate other people to get them to like you in order to not like someone else so you can feel better about yourself. And this, and one of the things that Luther talks about is, though, is he almost puts ourselves in the perspective of the Galatians, which is having with the wisdom to be able to see, wait, I can see what's going on here. This is a game of flattery being played, and I'm not interested in getting into the game of flattery that, and, and, and inside this manipulative circle. So that's the first comment that he makes that's good. Secondly, he mentions shut out or splitting. Luther suggests that if their zeal was sincere and godly, they would surely be content for the Galatians to love both the Judaizers and Paul and not hate Paul. Their desire to make the Galatians hate Paul showed the evilness of their zeal. Now, this is a very important point, I think, because if the Judaizers' motives were good and they actually had a belief, let's say they just had differing opinions, okay, which is very common in church, and a differing opinion in church work or in any relationship, Christian relationship, in any relationship, period. Differing opinions is good. 
But what Luther's saying is, if the motives would have been right, this circle would have been connected here. Not trying to split, but instead trying to come together and look at the differences of opinions and different perspectives. But that was, wasn't, what, wasn't what was happening at all. So what Paul is, or excuse me, what Luther is suggesting is that there's this disconnect. The Judaizers are not trying, if the motives were pure, differences of opinions aren't bad, but they would have been brought, bringing in the whole group, attempting to connect the dots here, connect the relationships, but no, this was a power play. This was the goal of this situation right here, was in order for the Judaizers to have more influence and to try to be more popular. Now, as we've talked about before, one of the main things that we talk about in Lives Transforming is this challenge that we have of trying to get our value and worth from other people's opinions. This is a classic example of that exact lie. The Judaizers are buying into the lie that they're more valuable if they can get other people, in this particular the Galatian people, to follow them and uh, be more popular with them. Now, the uh, Ryrie, Charles Ryrie's commentary says something that's very interesting in verse, regarding verse uh, 18. Let me see if I can find it here. And the, the comment here is, in verse 18 it says, um, notice how it says, but it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner. We were talking about motives there. And then it says this, and not only when I am present with you. Now, that's an interesting phrase, but what Ryrie makes this, explains this last phrase as meaning this, that Paul was not averse to having other ministers, other people minister to the Galatia people, the people of Galatia, as long as it was done sincerely in the truth. And so, what, what, what Paul is saying here is, look, but it's good to, have, to, to be sought in a commendable way. In other words, if people aren't trying to manipulate you, there's nothing wrong with seeking people out. And then he goes on to say, and not only when I'm present with you. In other words, it's not like I'm trying to be the only minister here. I'm not trying to be, I don't need to be in control. I don't need to be the one that you're focused on. I don't need to be the one that uh, everybody comes to. That's not what I'm talking about here. And Ryrie makes a great point, which is, what he means here is, is that other people ministering is a wonderful thing. I don't have to be with you. This really plays into when he talks about practice playing second fiddle. Yeah. Absolutely. Go ahead and say a little more about that, Brent. Well, no, I mean, the whole thing about Paul's you know, talking about, it's okay to be second fiddle. You don't always have to be center stage. Um, yeah. I think what he's doing is he's taking himself out of that, saying, listen, like you just said, I'm not the only key element here. There are others. You take this message yourself because each person's got different gifts and strengths who might be able to minister to somebody else in ways that, that I can't, you can't. I mean, I think it's, it's really important that each person gets that priesthood of all believers again, that yeah. we take this to, to go and use what God's gifted us with. Well, be I think Paul, in those things. I try. Paul is trying to, in some ways, disciple the Galatians so they can in turn then serve others. Um, letting them know that, that they will be sought out if they're serving in a healthy way. Yeah, that's exactly he's right. Around, whether he's around or not. And so we see in these two verses uh, some pretty powerful organizational church issues. And hold on one second. Go over here. Uh, what we see is how easy it is in an organizational church setting. And remember, this church setting wasn't exactly what you would call perfectly organized. It was, at this point in time, still in 50 AD, very unorganized. Uh, there, wasn't, there wasn't a hierarchy per se. But you start seeing some of the difficulties within an organization spelled out very, very clearly of the risks but here's what I think is the most important thing to take out, the take home of this particular thing. And that is the risks that we're really talking about that are coming, are coming from, again, this paradigm of legalism.
That's what's causing all the problems here. The problems that are coming from splitting, that are causing splitting, the problems of the Judaizers not wanting Paul to be involved, the problems of the motivational issues. Uh, see, the Judaizers could have simply said, well, to be honest with you, for me, let's say I'm a Judaizer, for me, I, I think circumcision is the best thing for me. And, and I believe that circumcision is the best thing for me. And, I, and that's part of my heritage, and that's what I believe that I need to follow. But no, that's not where they headed. They said, it's good for me, and you need to do it too. And not only do you need to do it, you need to get away from Paul. Paul is somebody you need to disconnect with. I, you need to follow us. You need to do what we want you to do. You see how different that is. And this is exactly the challenge that many organizations go through today. Now, you can see from the flattery to the understanding and reputation of popularity to the view of the Galatians not to be seduced, and then Ryrie's, I think, pretty in, insightful comment about this last phrase in verse 18 about we know, we will know in an organizational life, we're going to know pretty easily where our motivations are by whether or not we really want other ministers to be involved. You know, if you are a person that feels like that you have to have the power, that you have to have the influence, that people need to look to you, uh, and that somehow makes you feel better, well, then you are not going to want other ministers involved. You're going to want to be the sole person. You're going to want to be the focus of attention. And in a church setting, the person that tries to be the focus of attention and isn't wanting to have other ministers involved, you can see quickly how this gets out of control and gets very ugly. And this is exactly what Paul is facing in this church somewhere around 50 or 60, we think, 50 or 60 A.D. Okay, um, any other comments on that, guys, before we go on to the next two verses? Yeah, it's like Paul's wanting the Galatians to kind of be an organism working together as a body, and the Judaizers are wanting the Galatians to really focus on hierarchy, organization, you know, to put a structure in place that moves them away from serving. Well, and, moves, and, and moves them towards doing what, the, yeah, doing what the Judaizers want them to do. So it moves them towards legalism. That's right. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to do one last thing, which is read these two verses again. They eagerly seek you. Not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner. And not only when I'm present with you. You see how these two verses really take on a new meaning after we get through with this. They really come to life. My favorite, I guess, most poignant perspective of this verse is this. They eagerly seek you so that you will seek them. Now, this is a very challenging concept. Ask yourself, when you, that, right? yeah, when you seek someone, why are you doing it? Yep. Yeah, am, I, am I taking or giving? That's right. So here's the big challenge. When you seek someone, now we can list all kinds of things here. Are you, why are you doing it? When you seek someone, is it so that they will seek you? That is a tough question. Yeah. So, yeah. When, you, when you seek someone to go out to eat with, when you seek someone to date, when you seek someone to... Uh, partner with a business network, we'll say it, network in a business environment, okay? When you seek someone at church, see how difficult this question becomes now at this point? Yeah, to, to me, this is the big part of this whole lesson again. This is, it's all about what are my motives? Am I coveting? What's in it for me? This is, this is pretty big. Yeah. Now, help me, Derek, like, when I talk to or email you and I'm seeking you out for, for insight and for um, truth, you know, questions, right. is that 
but what kind of motive is that? Because I am wanting or needing, I think, something. Well, let's look at one truth. Yeah, but let's look at verse 18. But it is it was good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner. Yeah. And like Brent said, okay. you're so seeking you're fruit. Serving. Yeah. And see, this is why Paul you know, wisely puts verse 18 right after verse 17 is because he doesn't want people to get stuck right there, Lisa. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? It's, he yeah. doesn't want people to stop seeking people out. He doesn't right. want that to happen. He doesn't want you to stop seeking people out because, oh, I can't seek people out because then maybe that's something bad. He's not saying that at all. However, right. what if you were seeking me out to try to get me on your side so somehow you could stop, uh, so you could somehow uh, get me on your yeah. side so Brent would get out of your way? See what I mean? Yeah. Or so I that's could a feel totally just if I or I could feel justified for having negative feelings towards someone. Yeah, exactly. I can. I see. Well, and again, it's it's like picking friends and relationships for status. You know, I'm friends with such and such. I want to be seen with such and such. I want to be in that circle because of what it gives me. Right. That's right. Yeah. Now, again, grace solves this whole problem because once we are totally complete in Christ, once we understand we're already righteous, then we don't these motives go away that whole Bonhoeffer quote you did really fits well with this yeah 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 it really does and that Bonhoeffer quote goes something like this Okay, I must completely abandon any attempt to make something of myself. So when I am seeking truth, I am not trying to make something of myself. I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to grow. But contrast. But I, go ahead. Well, I, I was moving to the contrast, but go ahead. Yeah, but contrast that with what the Judaizers were doing. See, yeah. I must completely abandon any attempt to make something of myself. Clearly, the Judaizers were trying to make something of themselves. They were trying to be popular. They were trying to get yeah. something from the Galatians. They were seeking them out so the Galatians would seek them out. They were trying to get something from them so they could yeah. be somebody. But see, legalism always moves us towards needing to be somebody because we have to do something. Other people have to like us, so there's got to be somehow we've got to be a part of making something of ourselves. Grace says, wait a second. You're already somebody. God is in okay. you. Okay. Let's move on to these next two verses. This is some pretty good stuff, though, I think. These next two verses, Paul says this. He says, my children... Let me get the new screen here. My children, with who I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. And then he goes on in verse 20 to say, But I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. What we're going to do here is we're going to spend all the rest of the time on verse 19 and then just a few seconds at the end on verse 20. In fact, let's just do it... Um, we're going to do it the opposite. We're going to just talk about verse 20 right now. And verse, go ahead. Verse 20 is saying, you know, you guys are just really a pain in the butt sometimes. <laughs> well, I, I, I think that that certainly could be the case. However, I think that probably Luther gives some really interesting insight into verse 20. And it, we only have to take a couple minutes on it. But what it appears to me that's going on here is Paul ends with this, I wish I could be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Now, Luther makes this point, and he says this. It's very difficult to know how a recipient, for instance, of an email is going to respond 
when you're writing a letter. Okay, you you understand what I'm saying here? Uh, oh, yeah. See, if, if I send an email to you, you don't understand. You don't know how they're going to respond to what he's saying. That's right. The tone is questionable, mm -hmm. and you don't know how they're going to respond. So the response is also questionable. You can't see their face. Their, yeah. their faces are blank at this point because you're writing a letter. Okay? So that's why he's using such affection when he begins 19. Yes. He's trying to say, look, I don't have a clue how you're taking this. I don't understand because I, I, you know, I think I understand, but the problem is I can't see your eyes. I can't see your face. I can't see uh, what's happening. And so I wish I could be present with you. And when he says, and to change my tone, as if I wish I could be there so I could see your face and appropriately modify my communication to what's really going on. But right now, I'm perplexed. In other words, I'm not sure exactly what's going on because I'm not there. It's like I'm writing this email, and I don't know how you're actually responding right now. Um, but if I was there... I could then appropriately modify the way I'm communicating uh, is what is going on here. Uh, if, From Luther's perspective, he says this, if we are in front of a person, it is much easier to modify our tone and inflection depending on the reaction of the audience, which is why it's so crucial. I think the important lesson of verse 20 is, is this. It's important in a relationship of discipleship to have face time. <laughs> it shows yeah. how important it is that relationships aren't built just in emails. Relationships aren't built yeah. just on phone calls. But sometimes it's critically important when we can to be right next to somebody. Living and breathing right next to them is a very powerful thing. Luther brings this point up and I think it's very, uh, a very I think wise view of verse 20. Now we're going to spend the rest of the time on verse 19. Verse 19 has very few words and is extremely powerful. My children, with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. Okay, we have all kinds of things going on in these few words. First of all, Dallas or Dallas Theological Seminary, more to the point says this, Paul longed for these believers to be transformed into the image. In fact, I'm going to go so far as to read even something. I'm just going to read it right out of their commentary because I really think it's that good. Here's the commentary on verse 19. And what I really want to do is highlight these words right here until Christ is formed in you. And listen to what Dallas says. But a sudden change in metaphors occurred with the expression, until Christ is formed in you. So we have this very intimate uh, language, my children with whom I am again in labor, addressing them as this very connected, deeply connected spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship he has. However, a sudden change in metaphor occur with the expression, until Christ is formed in you. Paul longed for these believers to be transformed into, this would be the Greek word, morph, take on the form of, the image of Christ. This expression describes the Christian life as a kind of reincarnation of Christ in a believer's life. This is, in fact, God's ideal and purpose for Christ to live his life in you and then through you. And so what, if you can imagine what Paul's saying here, he's saying, oh, what I long for and what I ache for, like I was in labor pains, what I ache for is not for you to live this life of trying to make things, make yourself good enough by doing these things the Judaizers are talking about. What I ache for is that you can see that it's Christ in 
you that goes and lives out of you. Now, we're going to go into detail about this in, in a little bit, but it's Paul is clearly struggling because it's almost like he's saying, if you could, to the people, of, to the church of Galatia, if you could only understand this concept of Christ in you, then it would be so clear that the legalism makes no sense anymore. And it's almost like he's out of words, but he's still laboring and wants them to know how much he aches for them to understand the revelation that Christ is in them. That's what makes them valuable. Not whether they get circumcised, not whether they eat the right food, but because Christ is in them, and that is what then moves you to live out a life of obedience. We've talked about this before. Grace leads to obedience. Christ is in you, and then, so here again I'll read this. This is in fact God's ideal and purpose for Christ to live his life in you and then through each believer. And yeah, Paul is yeah. desperately wanting to communicate this concept. Okay. Yeah, and then the analogy then is God living out of us is um, Paul saying until Christ is formed in you, until you give birth, until I give birth, meaning you recognize how Christ is living out of you. The out of you is literal. To me, I'm being very literal, of, like giving birth to realizing that. Sure. You this know, Derek, I'm going back to, to uh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I'm going back to First First Corinthians 9, uh, verse 23 out of the message. Yeah. And it's interesting because you made, made a mention just a second ago about, you know, God being in us and then coming through us. Yeah. And I think many times, you know, we, we do confusion of that, that freedom from being used by God. I think the freedom from being used by God is when we're trying to get something out of being used by God, either yes. his approval or other people's approval. But Paul, in 1 Corinthians 9, he's talking about getting into other people's worlds, and this is a huge statement because he says, I did all this because of the message. I didn't want to just talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. And this whole thing is he's wanting God to be, for lack of a better term, you know, to, to be used through him, not for personal gain, but because of his passion and love for these, these, these children of God, as he calls them. Yeah, that's right. And the only way I can explain it in this area is that Paul is trying to explain to the Galatians, can you imagine what it would be like to live a life where you are completely free of all these external ways of getting your worth, but instead you are complete, where am I at here? But it, the fact that Christ is in you. Now, imagine, for instance, if the Judaizers completely understood that Christ was in them and completed them completely. Would they have to manipulate the Galatians? Would they have to try to split the Galatians from Paul? Right. See, they wouldn't have to do any of those things. In that moment, Christ is living, would, it, would be then living out of the Judaizers. They'd be living, see, in that moment, the Jew, Christ being in them would be living out of them because of who, because Christ is in them, not because of all these other things. And it's almost like Paul is like desperately trying to communicate this and doesn't know any other, you know how sometimes we've talked about this needs to be revealed and how Paul is almost like, I know I can't reveal this to you. Only God can reveal the power of Christ in you. However, I ache for it to be revealed to you, this concept of grace, this concept that you are already good enough. No law is going to make you even better. And once you understand you're already good enough, then you won't have a need to manipulate. You won't have a need to control. You won't have a need to split, which is moving you to be formed to imitate what Christ would be like. So Christ is in you, formed in you in that way. Now, I want to get to a couple other things here. Calvin, on the other hand, really goes a different direction. Not surprising. Remember, we talked about last week, and I'll remind you again, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to take time to write this down because we're running out of time. 
But Alistair McGrath, theologian from Oxford, mentions this, and I think uh, wisely so. The leading principle of the Reformation is generally considered to be the doctrine of justification. While there is unquestionably questionably much truth in this statement, it requires careful modification. To do justice to the historical evidence, the doctrine of justification is certainly a leading feature of the theology of Martin Luther. It was never, however, accepted within the more radical wing of the Reformation, the Reformed, which stressed the importance of obedience, discipleship, adopting doctrines of grace which stressed human responsibility, human accountability toward God, rather than God's transformation of the individual. Okay? What Paul is talking about here is a life being transformed by God. God transforming the individual. However, the Reformation's main focus from people other than Luther, which of course would have had to include probably the most influential theologian of the Reformation, which would be considered Calvin, that the importance of obedience and discipleship, adopting doctrines of grace which stressed human responsibility and human accountability. So, of course, we're going to see Calvin looking at this differently. And here's what he says. Verse 19, when he talks about Christ being formed in you, he's, Calvin continues to think Paul's motives for these words is to soothe the anger of the Galatians. He believes Paul has rebuked them, and thus they must be angry. Okay, now This isn't mentioned at all by the Dallas Theological Seminary, certainly not mentioned by Luther, but Calvin's perspective is uh, Paul must have just chewed them out. Paul must have rebuked these people for not doing what he's saying to do. So now he's going to be the nice guy. My dear children, I am again, I'm in labor for you. I do like you. I know I've rebuked you. You should... You should be doing what I'm telling you to do. That does have a hierarchical tone yeah. to it. He then clarifies that Paul does not set aside the former birth. Now, see, here's what's going on here. With whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. Um, remember, Calvin doesn't believe that... Calvin believes in the elect, so he now has to do something with this verse. He believes that only the elect can get saved, and God is the only, the sovereign God is the only thing that can get you saved. You can't do anything. In other words, God's already decided that you, you are going to be saved. Oh, and you, it, well, it's kind of further than predestination. It's like, not only does God know that you're going to be saved, but... You don't have a choice in the matter. God is sovereign. You don't have a choice in it. You are going to be saved, and you, you know, whether you like it or not, you're going to be saved. This is the doctrine of the elect. And yeah. because God is the one that does this, now there's no way for you to become unsaved. Does that make sense? Yeah. See, you can't become unsaved, uh, and the reason you can't become unsaved is because you had nothing to do with saving yourself before the beginning of time. God had elected you, and you, don't, you didn't have a choice in the matter at all. You didn't have a choice to become a Christian. Uh, that, that, didn't have, that, had, that was God's choice, not your choice. You know, and the danger in that theological viewpoint um, is, is a real sense of arrogance. And I've, you know, again, for 10 years I was steeped pretty heavily in, in Calvinistic thinking. And there was, a, I mean, from being in some of those circles, going to a lot of the different seminars around us, there was a real sense of arrogance about being the elect. And yeah. boy, it was just something. After a while, you just kind of wanted to just kind of get, get me out of the room. I can't get this ick off of me. Yeah. Calvin goes on to say, and certainly that is a risk. Of course, there's risks of any theological perspective, and that would be well. One. And right, and if you say that I choose, well, I was good enough to choose, and look yeah. at me. He goes on to say, Paul's analogy to a woman in labor is that the Galatians weren't, quote, completely born. This is suggesting that through the Holy Spirit you can be born more completely. Now, this actually lines up again very well with Alistair McGrath's perspective that suggests that they're adopting a doctrine of grace which stresses human responsibility and human accountability towards God. 
rather than God's transformation of the individual. In other words, there's, there's this stress of human responsibility and accountability, which doesn't sound bad at first until you add what's left, which means that there's a way for you to be born more completely. You see that? Now Luther would significantly disagree with this. He would say, when God is in you, you are completely born. You are com God replaced the dead man. You have completely become new. Here, though, Calvin suggests that there's a way to become born more completely. However, so, so this is, in, in, in some ways, stark contrast to Luther. On the other hand, Calvin then kind of uh, moves the other way a little bit, for lack of a better term. Calvin makes it at the kind of the end of his commentary. He says, if ministers wish to do anything, let them labor to form Christ, not to form themselves in their hearers. And so he, he kind of some way says, no, this isn't about a man trying to get another man to be better. We still know it's got to be God doing this. But at the same time, we've got to use our human effort to somehow be a little more complete. Because what, what Paul is saying here, what Calvin is saying that Paul is saying is Christ isn't formed in you so you need to work a little harder to be a little better okay Luther mm. vehemently disagrees Luther suggests that uh, verse 19 is an allegory parents beget the form of bodies excuse me here the form of bodies and teachers beget the form of the mind, and the form is given through the ministry of the world. Salvation, of course, never enters his mind, nor does the idea that their salvation of being born can be more complete ever cross Luther's mind in his commentary. This concept of more complete, being born more so, uh, us doing something to make us born more better, it, it just doesn't make any sense. And the reason is this. Luther refers to us to Colossians 3.10, and put on a new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. He re, he, Luther takes us to the doctrine of justification, that Christ is formed in you, is not something you do, but it's a new self given to you by faith. And so Luther refers to Colossians 3.10, which we may, probably don't have time to go to right now, I wish we did. And then he goes on to say, Christ is formed in you is not something you do, but it's this new self. It's God in you because your old self, we've talked about it in the three circles before with life transforming, has died. It's this new self that's given to you. That is transformed by it being renewed to a true knowledge. In other words, using your mind to think what's true, that's what transforms you. God always is the one that transforms you. And so, as Christ is being, Christ is in you, but he is formed in you through the transformation process that happens by the renewing of your mind to truth. Now remember, truth is God. And so Luther looks at this as Christ being formed in you as the formation, the morphing of your life to be like Christ that comes by the renewing of your mind through truth, which is God, so accordingly it's God that's changing you. It's not you humanly doing anything through effort to be born more completely, but instead focusing on the truth, which is God, that changes you. So this means, and this is a quote from his commentary, from uh, Luther's famous Galatians commentary, Quote, this means being renewed in the spirit of our mind and putting on the new nature which through God is created in true righteousness and holiness. And there he refers, and we'll go ahead and hit this, very refers to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, 
which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. This is very powerful language of how trans a life is transformed. It's renewed, it's transformed in the spirit of your mind, putting on the new self, which is in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth in you. Colossians. I love that phrase, spirit of your mind. It's a great phrase. Colossians 3.10, And have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. So now, using this language of Colossians 3.10 that Luther references, and Ephesians 4 that Luther references, he understands that Paul, when Paul is talking in Galatians, about Christ being formed in you. Let's go back to that. I labor until Christ is formed in you. Luther, instead of trying to suggest that this Christ being formed in you has anything to do with us, he instead, or or that it can be done more completely or less completely based on a human responsibility. He takes us to Colossians 3.10 and Ephesians 4 and says the morphing process of, the, uh, of humans happens through the renewal process as noted in Colossians, as noted in Ephesians. And it happens, we are renewing our minds but what we're doing is, is we're thinking about what's truth. And we renew our minds on what is true. And since God is truth, that's what's changing us. Again, go back up to here in verse, uh, to Dallas. It is God that's doing the changing in here. Or back to Alistair McGrath one final time. The Reformed stressed the importance of doctrines of grace that continued to stress human responsibility and accountability towards God rather than God's transformation of the individual. Here we see stark contrast. Here we see a stressing of human effort to change, and here we see an effort of God changing the human. I think it's critical for us to understand these different theological perspectives. Obviously, Life's Transforming lines up more closely with Luther's perspective, but if we don't understand the different history of our theology and different perspectives of theologians, entire congregations, entire uh, de denominations are based on these different individuals. And we won't have any idea of how to even understand their perspectives if we don't have, an, have a view of how these different theologians, whether it be Dallas Theological Seminary faculty, uh, purely evangelical, or somebody like Calvin or Luther looks at these. I think this is, again, fascinating. And for life's transforming perspective, reinforces, once again, these powerful verses that the renewal process is God changing us, not us morphing ourselves. Okay. Yeah, the active transformation is done by His Spirit. Exactly. Awesome. So we're out of time. Uh, we're going to finish up. Uh, Brent, anything else to add? No, I mean, I'm just, I'm just, we're kind of going through this. I'm finding myself leaping through Galatians, Ephesians, you know, and yeah. just kind of looking. He uses so much of the same language, so yeah. much. And he, many times he keeps talking about doing things not to get something, but doing it in Thanksgiving and, and right motives. Yeah. And it's, and it's right. Because he's comparing again, he's going back and saying, these guys were doing it with the wrong motives. Right. Don't be like that. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I'm going to pray and we'll be done. Lord, thank you for these uh, insights that you've given us from some incredible thinkers that uh, you have breathed into over the last hundreds and hundreds of years and being able for us to be uh, see them, hear them again alive today, hear you working through these individuals, and yet hear you afresh and new uh, again, brand new, uh, working in and through us. Uh, just as Paul talks about uh, these Galatians having Christ in them and being formed in them, we too are the Galatians. 
uh, with you in us being formed in us. In Jesus' name, amen.